Well, fancy seeing you here. It's <laughs> Tuesday. This is Rising. It's our show, and we're going to tell you all about it right now. Good morning, Brianna. Good morning, Robbie. What's going on? Well, today, Robbie, we are officially 461 days out of the presidential election of uh, 2024. <laughs> I was groan, just everyone groans. <laughs> I mean, I know that's a long way out still in normal people terms, mm -hmm. but we're right in the thick of it in pundit terms. And I can't believe, frankly, that we're talking about 2024 because I still feel like we're 400 odd days out from the 2020 election. That's where my mind still is. Oof. But we have new polling. A new New York Times Siena College poll shows that Joe Biden and former President Trump are, in fact, in a dead heat. The survey conducted July 23rd to July 27th found that 43 percent of registered voters said that they would support Biden in a 2024 rematch, while another 43 percent said they would back Trump in the top contest. Well, according to the poll, Democrats are falling in line behind President Biden, which is a change from last year when nearly two thirds of his own party said that they wanted a different nominee. The Times writes, quote, Mr. Biden has recovered significantly from last summer. At the time, Democratic grumblings about his likely reelection bid had mounted, and a Times Siena poll found that 64 percent of Democrats said they did not want the party to renominate him, including 94 percent of Democrats under the age of 30. But now, only half of all Democrats said they did not want Mr. Biden to be the nominee in 2024. Despite the seeming vibe shift, Biden is still broadly unpopular with 39 percent of all voters approving of his job as commander in chief. And when it comes to the primary, 64 percent of Democrats who plan to participate in their party's primary support Biden, while 13 percent preferred Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and 10 percent chose Marion Williamson. Here's Trump on the campaign trail in Iowa. We just swamp them. You know, there's a point at which the cheating doesn't help them. And that's sort of what's happening right now, I think. People are so sick and tired of this guy in, uh, in the White House. He's the most corrupt, I'm telling you, the most corrupt anyone's ever seen. Meanwhile, Biden is sticking to what his administration describes as the success of Bidenomics. Let's listen. I came to office determined, determined to move from a trickle-down economics that everyone from the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and the, it's called Bidenomics for the plan that's working, building from the bottom up, the middle out. Folks, uh, you know, all the trickle down stuff, when you, the wealthy do very well, we all do well. Well, my dad was an honorable man. My dad worked like the devil, a real gentleman. But not a whole lot ever trickled down on our kitchen table, if you're middle class folks. I didn't get much. According to Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, it's leading to a boom in manufacturing. Tulsi Gabbard had some choice words to describe Bidenomics the other day on Fox News. Let's play that. Bidenomics essentially is fascism, a kind of national socialism where we have government bureaucrats and and, and politicians partnering and colluding with these massive co corporations and the ultra rich to make these business deals, uh, picking winners and losers that serve their own self interest and the interests of the power elite at the cost of the well being of the American people, not only today, but in the increasing debt that they are incurring, incurring that will affect us for generations to come. And foremost, the perfect example of this, Laura, you and I've talked about this before, is the military industrial complex. Let's start by talking about some of these polls. The New York Times celebrating Biden having only 50% of his party not wanting him to be the nominee, as opposed to two thirds of his party not being the nom wanting him to be the nominee. I guess I get that that is a shift in the right direction from last summer, but isn't it still a problem that half of Democrats don't want him to run? It's amazing that Biden is less popular among Democrats than Trump is among Republicans. It is uh, interesting, it, isn't it? It's, it's the reality. And, and frankly, the move in this direction uh, toward more Democrats being OK, at least, with Biden being the nominee, I wonder if that is part of what just the natural consequence of him making the announcement, the reality that he's going to be the nominee, yeah. the way the media has covered uh, his uh, nomination as inevitable and completely um, it's, you know, blacklisted all of the other nominees, Marion Williamson and RFK Jr., from really being a part of the media discourse whatsoever. I mean, Eric Levitz just wrote a piece in New York Mag a few days ago in which he described Cornel West as the only left challenger to Joe Biden, seemingly memory holding the existence of Marion Williamson. 
Absolutely. I, I think the different situation that Biden is in right now versus last summer, though, frankly, is that we have the mid we had the midterms. Mm -hmm. Last summer, um, it, you know, the economy was not in, in the shape anybody wanted it to be in. Um, it looked like Democrats were cruising for bruising mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Senate, House races, et cetera. And then, I mean, you have to hand it to Biden. They did better than expected. The Democrats did much better by historical standards for mm -hmm. the party in charge. Usually they just lose naturally. Um, he held it together pretty well. And now you can say that was the abortion ruling. You can say that was tr the lingering effect of you know, Trump's handpicked candidates underperforming in a couple of states. But, you know, whatever you can make and as many excuses as you want. Biden has somehow held this coalition together. And there's, you know, I there, there's no one. It seems obvious person who, who would step up to replace him with that same degree of success. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's true. I mean, cynically, uh, those on the broad left who've been frustrated about the Democratic Party's choice not to codify Roe, even when someone like Barack Obama ran on it as a priority mm -hmm. and had the votes to do it, um, there is a belief that Democrats intentionally don't do those things because they can use abortion as a way to bully people to the polls, exactly as happened in midterms last year. So even if it's true that Biden was shepherding the Democratic Party through that victorious moment. The fact that abortion did seem to be such a significant driver in that moment is almost a cautionary tale for some on the left who are frustrated about being kind of manipulated in that way. But let me ask you about the tightening race between Biden's challengers. The mainstream media doesn't want to talk about them, but they're there. RFK Jr. was previously significantly ahead of Marion Williamson at around 20 percent, and Marion Williamson was around 13 percent. Marion's numbers have dipped slightly, but RFK Jr.'s have dipped, dipped dramatically. Now they're only three points apart, 10 percent to 13 percent. To what do you attribute that? I mean, RFK Jr. is getting a lot of positive attention from um, alternative media platforms, from conservatives. He's been on Fox News a lot. I, I think a lot of what he has to say, not all of it, but a lot of what he has to say, particularly about COVID, lockdowns, mm -hmm. mandates, et cetera, um, just kind of contrarian ideas, uh, resonates with the right more than it does Democrats. I think uh, Democrats might have been open to him when they heard the name, and that now they're becoming more familiar with him. And honestly, they're they're becoming familiar. If you're a Democrat, you do, many Democrats do, you know, not in the independent leftist mode, but nor a lot of normal Democrats do take their cues from mainstream media, from CNN, et cetera. And you're just hearing uh, constantly that this man is a conspiracy theorist and an anti-Semite. And if you're a Democrat who trusts those sources, I think you're probably internalizing those messages and his support there is collapsing. I, I think a lot of those smears were deeply unfair. We, you know, we've had we've explained that on our show. We've interviewed him about it. But that's the reality of the situation. I yeah, think. I mean, to the extent that RFK Jr. was has been a pretty online candidate and using he has said that he believes that podcasts as a as a venue can serve him and his campaign in the same way television as an early technology served his uncle uh, half a century ago. He has gotten support among a relatively online audience. And we've talked a lot about there's that right-leaning, independent-leaning streak of that audience. But there also were a lot of leftists who were genuinely enthusiastic about his campaign. And I would also just point out that I do think that some of his repeated statements uh, about Israel-Palestine have turned off a significant part of the left cohort that was legitimately invested in him as a potential challenger to, to Joe Biden. I know I don't think it's a broader litmus test among liberal MSNBC voters. Certainly, I don't, I don't know that they've ever criticized RFK Jr. on that basis. But among the left online support that might also have been contributing to his, uh, poll, his positive poll numbers, there's been a sharp decline as he's repeatedly um, re repeated what Marion Williamson has described as APAC talking points uh, about Israel. Hmm. You think there's enough, enough of your people to, to affect his poll numbers well, to turn on him for this? If there's enough online conservatives to affect his poll numbers, yeah. you know, I think that the left is a part of that, of that online audience that he had been cultivating. Mm. Um, what do you make of, you know, this race, um, the polling? Let's say it's, it's Trump and Biden, as looks overwhelmingly likely. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rematch that no one on <laughs> earth is exactly <laughs> clamoring for and yet is, is what we're going to get. No one... No one, no one wants this. No. We're living. We're going to live through something that no one wants. Like, like, how do we just grapple with that? We're just going to have this again till the know. end of time. 
these are choices this that are being— This is Trump forever, and, I mean, Biden can only run as if he won. He couldn't run again, but— Yeah, I mean, these are choices that Hillary are— Hillary can get back in there. I don't know. I was, I, was almost, I was almost thinking, like, would I prefer a 2016 Hillary, match? Trump— At least it's more interesting. Biden, Trump. <laughs> Biden, Trump. You could do Hillary, Trump again. Yeah, I mean, there is this weird irony that Hillary kind of took herself out of the game after she lost in 2016. There was a presumption that that was her turn and that was her last shot, despite being younger than many of the players that are still in the race right. uh, today. I wonder if she's sitting somewhere uh, in a beautifully appointed house, uh, very chagrined at that reality. But look, this is what happens when you have parties. Well, I'll talk about the Democratic Party. Parties that uh, that cultivate uh, political dynasties have multiple Clintons and, and on the Republican side, multiple Bushes, but don't actually engage younger politicians mm -hmm. and cultivate them for leadership. We've seen this in on the smaller scale in the House with Nancy Pelosi taking so long to relinquish the reins. And the the fresh blood that she's now turned it over to is someone like Hakeem Jeffries, not people like although I have my concerns about them, Pramila Jayapal or any of these younger squad members. In Congress, if you're in your late 50s, you're considered to be a spring chicken. And there are the consequence of that, of the older generation holding onto power this long, means that there are very few people that actually have the chops, the national profile, et cetera, to take the reins when someone like Joe Biden falters potentially with some of these um, cognitive and health concerns that folks have been raising. It's, it's a gerontocracy. I wonder, I, I say this a lot, how it affects um legislation, you know, coming down on tech issues where uh, young, where we would certainly benefit, I think, from having younger people making these decisions or weighing in on them. Um, it's just, it's a, you know, I mean, Mitch McConnell last week had, right. a, had a little health episode where he, he lost his train of thought. It's very hot out right now, fine, whatever. But this is happening over and over again with leadership in both parties because they're, they're not pushed out. They cling to power forever. And nobody, we're all so frustrated with these choices. Is that these are vote? hugely negative and hugely disliked figures. Is that a, a, a vote for young whippersnapper Ron DeSantis, who's in his early 40s? <laughs> He's young. He's, he's very young. young. He's only a little older than you and I. I do, he's <laughs> very much only a little older than me, and I was a little chagrined to discover that fact. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, look, that is something the voters are going to be thinking about going into this. Ron DeSantis has had a hard time. His poll numbers have also fallen uh, dramatically. Uh, and it seems to be, again, related to his actual behavior. I'd say the same thing of RFK Jr., um, that they're, they're putting things out there that the public just isn't picking up. And Ron DeSantis' bet on wokeness didn't follow through. Maybe if he had used his uh, youthful energy and talked more about tech or automation or some um, labor issues that are more germane to the interests of average people, he'd be faring a little better. But look, as we said, we're still 400 plus days out from the election and we will see what happens. We'll bring you all of the news coming up. Stay with us. More Rising After This.